We are continuing from chapter 9, verses 20 to 22. We stopped there the last time and I mentioned that these verses require a little deeper explanation. And we can start. The master of three sciences, Vidyas, who drink Soma and whose sin is purified, having performed sacrifices, seek to reach heaven. They, reaching the meritorious world of the king of gods, enjoy the celestial pleasures of gods in heaven. They, having enjoyed that vast celestial world, upon the exhaustion of merit, enter the world of mortals, thus resorting to the law of threefold existence. Desiring desires, they remain in the cycle of coming and going. Those people, however, who having no other worship contemplating me, I bear their prosperity in this world and the next as they are ever joined to me in yoga. The first verses are referring to those who practice rituals. It is referring to the Vedic practices known as the Karmakhand or those ritual practices which are very, very elaborate. The purpose of these rituals has never been moksha has never been liberation. The idea behind these rituals has been prosperity, appeasing the gods, the celestial beings, and seeking their favor. Those who remain on that path will return to these planes of existence. Those who wish to be liberated must take the yogic path. Through the performance of rituals, sacrifices, you do gain some merit by appeasing the gods and gaining their favor. You do gain some merit and this you can enjoy in the celestial planes. First and foremost, we must understand that there are three planes of existence. The celestial plane of consciousness or existence, the human plane of existence and the nether worlds. In some of the earlier verses, we talked about microcosm versus macrocosm. We explained that just as we come forward from the Jivatman, we come forward because we have desires and we take form of a body. Similarly, there are three worlds. Just as there are three planes of consciousness, waking, dreaming and deep sleep, there are three worlds. What happens when you are sleeping? You experience pleasurable dreams or you experience nightmares, bad dreams. Imagine, whilst you are dreaming, you die. You have no body anymore. The body is gone. This is more or less what happens to a person 
who crosses to the other shore, the one who has departed or separated from his body. This is what happens. You are in something like similar to a dream state, only disembodied. When those dreams or those that state is pleasurable, then it is experienced as heavenly or we refer to heaven or paradise. And when it is unpleasant, we say, oh, that was a terrible nightmare. It was like hell. If you imagine the nightmares that you could have, imagine the worst nightmares that you've had. Surrounded by poisonous snakes, experiencing tortures. Isn't this always been how hell was described in all the scriptures of the world? You go to any of the scriptures, whether it is from a Christian tradition, from Buddhist tradition, from all the different native traditions of the world, they describe them similarly. They, they imagine some extremely terrible things and they say that's hell. Isn't that what we experience in nightmares? And that is exactly what hell is. If you have pleasant dreams, imagine you have a beautiful dream where you're surrounded by gorgeous flowers, beautiful people, lovely lights. This is exactly how heaven has been described in different scriptures of the world. And these are nothing other than planes of consciousness. These are basically the samskaras that you experience when you are disembodied. If you gain merit and you perform sacrifices, you perform rituals, you will be experiencing the celestial or heavenly planes. However, at some point of time, when your merit is exhausted, when there is again a desire to experience earthly planes, the desire brings us back to the earthly plane. And that cycle of birth and death continues. To be free from this cycle of birth and death and rebirth, we must be liberated and attain moksha. That is only possible when through meditation, deeper understanding, regular practice, we are able to purify our minds and eventually be able to see through to that pure consciousness, that treasure that is within all of us. And when you are able to rest in that, you are joined in yoga. You have attained a state of union with the self, with the universal self. Such a person is not reborn. Those who perform Vedic rituals and sacrifices, they spoke of a legendary Somaras. Somaras was a juice or nectar. And it's, they said it gave you immortality. This is 
not a real juice or a plant out of which this juice is extracted as many people have tried to find this legendary plant, the soma, supposedly a, a creeper of sorts. There is a deeper meaning to somaras, also just known as amrit or nectar, the nectar of immortality. You drink from this nectar when the kundalini rises and she, the mother, unites with Shiva, her lord. And then that divine union is experienced as a sense of limitless joy and that is the yogic soma on piercing the soma chakra one experiences a sense of intoxication there are many temples in India the temples of Bhairav Bhairav is one of the forms of Shiva and Bhairav was a form that is a tantric form and to most gods or goddesses one makes an offering of flowers, of fruit, of coconuts sweets. These are the offerings you take to most gods and goddesses. But Bhairav, he was a tantric symbol of that state attained on piercing the Soma Chakra. And therefore, the offering to Lord Bhairav has always been traditionally the offering of wine or alcohol. It is quite amusing to see some of these temples in India, the temples of Lord Bhairav, Bhairavnath. The devotees bring little bottles of alcohol. So it's not as, um, you know, fine as, as a bottle of wine, but they bring little bottles of rum or vodka or even whiskey and this is offered to Lord Bhairav. It's collected then and I don't know what the priests do with it but I presume they dispose it off. Most of the people who make these offerings do not know why they're making this offering. They do not understand the symbolism behind this offering. The symbolism is attaining that blissful state of union and going beyond all the three worlds, being liberated and not having to come back to this cycle of birth, death and rebirth. Any thoughts, questions so far? Okay, in that case, I'll continue. The next group of verses is similar, it's related to what we spoke about here. Verses 23 to 25. Even those devotees 
of other deities whose sacrifice endowed with faith. They too, O son of Kunti, sacrifice to me alone, even though in an inappropriate manner. I alone am the receiver of the offerings of all sacrifices, and I alone am their master. However, they do not recognize me as such, and therefore they slip from reality. Those whose vows are directed towards gods go to the gods. Those whose vows are addressed to the ancestors go to the ancestors. Those who sacrifice to spirits go to those spirits. Those who sacrifice to me come to me. These verses, like the previous verses, are referring to the macrocosm. We are talking about the lokas here. The lokas are the different planes of consciousness. So if you are offering to deities, to celestial beings, out of ignorance, in a way, directly or indirectly, this offering goes to the Supreme Lord, that is pure consciousness. After all, everything is pure consciousness. Even the deities, even the celestial beings are part of that pure consciousness. It refers to this kind of offering as inappropriate. Why is it inappropriate? Because these are yogic scriptures and not Vedic scriptures. In Vedic scriptures, they favor appeasing the gods, the celestial beings and asking for favors. But yogic scriptures are uncompromising. They say that this may be considered as a stepping stone, but it is not the right way. After all, it is important to recognize that all the offerings must be made to pure consciousness. After all, everything is pure consciousness. Even the gods, the celestial beings are also bound by the same laws that you are bound by, the laws of duality. The only one that is beyond these laws is the non-dual self, the cosmic universal self. Those who sacrifice and offer to deities, they do not recognize this and therefore they fall. They cannot attain that highest reality. What happens if you worship or appease gods, celestial beings? Then you go to celestial beings. In a very beautiful way, we should understand that the Supreme Lord, pure consciousness, is very generous, very loving, and if that is what you want, that is what you get. This is the highest form of Ahimsa. If you settle for celestial planes, which are sensual planes, planes of pleasure, then you will go to those planes. I'm sure whichever tradition you come from, you may have heard of the descriptions of 
heaven or paradise being a place where there are dancing damsels and music and pleasures which are being experienced. These are sensual pleasures. And that is, in fact, what you then experience until, of course, it's time for you to come back to the earthly plane. Those who sacrifice to spirits go to spirits. What are the spirits we are referring to here? These are the nether worlds. Those who have not worked on their positive aspects, who have a very dark nature, what will they experience when they sleep at night? What kind of dreams will they get? I'm sure all of you have noticed this. If you watch um, a, a movie or a television at night, just before you go to bed, and you watch something very, very disturbing. For example, you watch uh, a movie about serial murderer. You know, real terrible stuff, very frightening. What kind of dreams will you get? Krishna, what kind of dreams would you get if you would watch such movies at night? You were mentioning that I was just thinking about myself. Mm -hmm. uh, a dream that you're part of that misery, kind of part of that very harrowing experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Uh, I can say safely that if you uh, have watched such a movie at night, you will get some terribly bad dreams, maybe also experiencing yourself being maybe a victim or maybe even being the aggressor. Right? Yes. Yes. So that is a bit like saying that if these are the samskaras you have all the time, if this is what you have been doing, and spending your life doing such things or thinking such things or surrounding yourself with dark thoughts and living in such an atmosphere, then it's not going to be different when you die. Those are the samskaras you take with you and that's what you have created. You create your own heaven or your own hell. While this, to some people, sometimes sounds uh, sometimes uh, sounds very fatalistic, and they say, "Oh, that means I have to go to heaven or hell." Through this explanation, you can imagine that, in fact, it is very much in your hands what you are going to experience. If you put such thoughts in impressions in your mind. Your mind will dwell on these. If you organize your life, purify your mind through meditation, you will experience positive and beautiful impressions. So you are the architect of your own destiny. This is not a fatalistic book. It is not a book that encourages escapism either. It puts your life squarely in your hands. Your destiny is also in your hands. You can change it now. And those who want to be liberated, they focus on meditation, on going beyond these dualities by purifying their minds and establishing themselves in the cosmic self or pure consciousness. So this was a deeper understanding of these different planes of existence, the mystery of heaven, hell and the human plane of consciousness has been 
revealed here. Some people say, oh, I don't believe in things like heaven and hell. To which I always say, you don't have to believe in it. You already are in it. Your life, you make it into heaven or hell. Depending on your personality. And what you experience at night is the same. Because you are unaware of it. You may not know it. You get up in the morning and you say, oh, I had no dreams. But maybe your partner tells you, oh, you know, you were so disturbed. You, you were screaming and shouting in your dreams last night and you were tossing and turning. What happened? Because you were experiencing some terrible dreams, but you don't remember it next morning. It's exactly what happens when you are reborn. You don't remember what happened in that state between births, between death and birth. Any thoughts or questions about this? Somehow it is to be able to uh, to be able to remember these harrowing experiences or whatever it is that we face hmm. seems to be related to how how intense and how 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 nice we practice those you know last few days. So it almost seems like uh, how to say there is a part of you which is kind of afraid to practice too intensely because when you go to sleep all these things will come up whatever you've seen or. Hmm. Yes. So, uh, yeah, you, you see, so then, when you practice, when you do go into deeper meditation, you get more aware. That is the idea, becoming more aware. When you become more aware, of course, you're going to see what is stored in the unconscious mind. And some of the stuff is not pleasant. There is no way you can escape that. When you go through it with awareness, you are able to purify your mind faster this way. And you go through that experience um, consciously means it's, it's done with it. You're done with it. It's about shortening that span of experience. If you're unconsciously experiencing, as, for example, in sleep, or in after death, then you're unconsciously experiencing. And that simply takes longer. You simply have to live out more lifetimes and go through this cycle much, much longer. So the process of meditation is a shortcut it speeds up this process of fructifying your samskaras. Some of you may know the story of Yudhishthir. Yudhishthir is the elder brother of Arjun, who is the hero of the Bhagavad Gita. And Yudhishthir, when he dies, uh, somehow ends up in hell. This is terribly shocking because Yudhishthir was supposed to be the most righteous uh, incarnation of Lord of Dharma. And how was he in hell? Though it was very brief, it is explained, it is said, that he had to go through that experience because of some of his karma, a lie that he had said. This is a way of explaining how we can speed up a process by going through it consciously. Because those of you who know the story may remember that Yudhishthir 
was the only one who left his body consciously. He went to heaven consciously. And so he experienced hell consciously, very brief, and then he was in heaven. So, to come back to what you, you said, Krishna, what meditation is about is speeding up the process. It's a bit like going to the bank and if you have taken a loan, it's not like your loans don't have to be repaid. They still have to be repaid. It just depends on how fast you repay your loans. And if you go through a process of meditation, you're just able to speed up the process. Yeah, thanks. Uh, coming back to the bank analogy, uh, it seems like uh, sometimes when you don't go to the bank for a long time, mm. you think of your life and you think that, oh, there was a time when I didn't even know I had loans. Mm. And it seemed uh, simpler. But yeah, once you once you've known the truth, you have to go to the other side. There's no coming back. Yeah. Okay, verses 26 to 28. Whoever offers me a leaf flower, fruit or water with devotion, that gift of a person of controlled self, offered with devotion, I accept. Whatever you do, sacrifice or give, whatever austerities you perform, O son of Kunti, surrender that as an offering unto me. Thus you will be freed from the bondages of actions whose fruits are beautiful or ugly, yourself, united in the yoga of renunciation, liberated, will reach me. This is a very simple group of verses which refers to the fact that it is the bhava that matters. We don't have to do long, complicated practices. We don't have to do difficult things. We don't need lots and lots of time. Often students come to me and say, Oh, I don't have time. I can't do this. You know, I'm a very busy person. I have a family. And often they say, Oh, I wish I could renounce and and devote my entire life to this. And I say, that's not necessary. What matters is the bhava, and that's really the only thing that matters. With what devotion, with the, the intensity of desire, you seek the highest. So, some of you may know the story that sage Narad thought that he was the greatest devotee because he was continuously chanting the Lord's name. So he got a little bit puffed up with pride, got a little arrogant, and he went to Sri Krishna and said, Oh, you know, I am your greatest devotee. There is none other who is greater than me. And Sri Krishna looked very doubtful. So Narad said, Oh, do you have doubts? Is there somebody else who is greater than I am? And Sri Krishna said, yes, indeed. There is one who is very, very beloved of mine because he is my greatest devotee. And he said, indeed, I must see this person. Who is he? And Sri Krishna takes him to a humble farmer who is very busy the whole day, toiling in the field, working no time at all. And the whole day, he took the Lord's name only twice. Narad was very shocked. He said, how can you consider him to be your greatest devotee? He said your name only twice. I am repeating your name all the time. And Sri Krishna said, well, the rest of the time he's really busy. But the moment he has time, he thinks of me. It is about... 
the bhava, the intensity of desire, and not so much about the time and how complicated the practice is. Whatever you offer, however little it may be, it is accepted. And remember, by offering is not meant leaf, flower, fruit, water. These are <clears throat> mere material objects. What is offered is yourself, your actions. Everything that you do can become an offering. Your entire life can become an offering. When you work in that spirit, when you enjoy your life in that spirit of selflessness, of doing without expecting a skill that is to be cultivated, then all that is offered to the Lord. Such a one is freed from the bondage of karma, from all dualities, beautiful or ugly, freed from all dualities including birth and death, to be united in yoga with the cosmic self. Any comments so far? Balaji, what do you think of this? Will you give me an understanding of uh, how, how we should perform our, uh, maybe what all that we do in our life, as well as uh, when we do meditation, uh, what are we gain, uh, what are we get? Just as surrender, so this is what I could have been through, Yes, yes. Yes, it's a bit like uh, when you enjoy doing something, you know, like a hobby. If you have a hobby, some people enjoy gardening, some people like to go for walks. You do it without a purpose. You don't have an objective, you don't have a goal. If we do all the things, work, relationships, without that expectation or wanting something out of it, you do it purely for the joy of it, for the love of it, then entire life can become an offering. Okay, continue. Verses 29 to 33. I am alike to all beings. No one is hated or beloved of me. However, those who devote themselves to me with devotion, they are in me. I am also in them. Even if a person of very bad conduct devotes himself to me, following no other, he should be considered saintly. He is embarked on right determination. Very quickly, he becomes a person whose self is virtuous and attains eternal peace. O son of Kunti, do know for certain, my devotee does not perish. Making themselves depend on me, even the lowest, even the lowly born, as well as women, traders and servants, reach the supreme status. How much more so the meritorious Brahmins, devotees and royal sages. Having come to this transient and happy world, do devote yourself to me. These are very encouraging verses. However bad your conduct may have been, there are many people who are 
not honest, manipulative, they may be stealing, may be attached to things, they may be materialistic, may sound judgmental, it's not bad, but these are <coughs> traits and tendencies where you are strengthening the aspects of duality. So, even if you have not done much until now, but if you start, if you're on the right track, you will progress very quickly. If, he, if you are focused, if you are devoted, and if you are very clear, one-pointed, then you will progress very quickly. Such a devotee will not perish. Such a person is protected and all the good merit, the good actions are working in his favor. There's a verse here that may disturb some of us. It refers to the lowly born as well as women, traders, servants. And uh, I, I'm, I don't like the translation too much. It should have read, in spite of, irrespective of birth, gender, um, social status, you can reach the Supreme. It means that eternal wisdom is for all. No one is excluded from this. Some of you are aware that the Vedic knowledge was a privilege only for the higher castes. But this knowledge, Atmajyan, knowledge of the self, is not restricted to anybody. It is not a privilege of a few. It is for all who desire and long for it. There are no restrictions. This verse makes the Bhagavad Gita a tantric text. So, anybody and everybody, irrespective of his birth, gender, social status, race, whatever, can attain the highest. So, those who have already attained some merit have had a, have a higher birth. Those were devotees, royal sages. What are royal sages? <clears throat> These are those who take care of others. They have wisdom and they take care of others. Isn't that what kings did? <clears throat> kings took care of the subjects. Many traditions of the world, spiritual teachers, were portrayed as kings because they take care of the others. Okay. Any thoughts or comments on this so far? Radhanaji? Yes. Doesn't this also lead to, uh, so somebody who does not uh, have some, like have a teacher to interpret this, this for them, it's very easy to kind of interpret this as being uh, a license to do whatever you want, right? Like uh, you, you, like you can do whatever you want as long as you are a devotee to Krishna. It's essentially Krishna stating that I will protect you no matter what hmm? nonsense you do. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, Sri Ram, all the scriptures and all the texts can be misinterpreted and have been misinterpreted. 
That is why a lot of people believe that Indian tradition, yoga tradition is very fatalistic. You know, the idea of Hinduism being fatalistic and everybody talks about, oh, this is my destiny, I have to suffer. Or things like, oh, God wanted me to suffer. These are ideas which come from misinterpretation of texts, of scriptures. So you're absolutely right. It may be read in that context um, that we are talking about a deity, Sri Krishna. It can be misread as if you do whatever you want to do, but I will protect you as long as you worship me in the sense of uh, superficial worship, uh, you know, making offerings, etc. So, misinterpretation is always, always possible and has always been happening and is going to happen. That is simply the nature of the mind. Those who want to misinterpret it will. And those who have values, who have a certain um, character, you know, a strong character, they will discriminate and say, no, this cannot possibly be a license to do whatever I want. Yes, we, there, there is uh, always a possibility of misinterpretation. Yeah. Alright, and so with that, we are now coming basically to the last verse. I see Krishna has written something about Narad when we go through phases when we practice. Basically, uh, what Sri Ram mentioned already. Yes. It's not, the, the, these verses are definitely not about superficial practice. This is about uh, deeper devotion. That's why it mentions bhava here. The bhava is important, the intensity. Verse 34 is the last verse of this chapter. Let your mind be fixed on me. My, devo my devotee, sacrifice unto me. Bow unto me. Intent on me, thus joining yourself in yoga, you will come only to me. How can you fix your mind on pure consciousness? How do you sacrifice to pure consciousness? How do you bow down to pure consciousness? We talked about this in some of the earlier sessions. This is known as constant remembrance. If you would like to have a Sanskrit word for it, it's also known as a japa japa. A japa japa means doing japa without doing japa and basically what it means is awareness complete awareness being conscious all the time witnessing everything this constant awareness does not come instantly with a snap of fingers it's a long process. You go through systematic meditation. It may take years of practice, of deepening the practice, purifying the mind, and attaining that eternal wisdom. There are no shortcuts. This is the shortcut. The meditation is the shortcut. We need to go through certain processes in ourself, 
and integrate these energies before we can attain something. For all those who sometimes get impatient, who are who have been doing a lot and still sometimes feel I've not attained, attained anything, I've not achieved anything and you need to understand that certain things have certain time which it requires. It takes nine months for a baby in the womb to develop. We cannot really speed in that up. If you try to cook something and you turn on the heat fully in an effort to cook it faster, the result is terrible. The result is that you're going to burn the food. So certain things have a time frame and we cannot really rush it. We can go through a bit faster if you have a speedier method, if you have a good practice in the sense that you're very regular, you're, you're practicing daily, and if you have a good method, a speedy method, effective method, then yes, the process gets a little faster, but there are certain constraints, and you have to live with those constraints. If you come in the world with a certain amount of baggage of samskaras, you will have to deal with that. But do not lose hope. Keep your mind fixed, on track, be focused and meditation will bear fruit. That is the law of karma. And in this case, then, the law of karma works in your favor. Okay, any questions about that? Is that... All good. I have one question regarding a previous comment you made regarding the bhava. Mm -hmm. uh, so what what can one do if uh, he's kind of aware that his bhava is not right at this moment, but he wants it to be all right, and combined with this impatience thing? So what if there are phases where you know your bhava isn't right, but you're not happy with it, and uh, yeah, so how do you handle such times? Uh, that, that is a very general question. Of course, it depends on the person and depends on the situation. So I would not really um, want to commit myself or fix myself to any answer. And I would say it, it really depends. But in general, it's also a matter of time. And uh, if you are impatient, then of course you're impatient. But it's also some, sometimes a matter of, of time. There are many factors that influence this uh, matter of uh, how strong your intensity is to, to grow and transform, whether your method is good or not, you know, how effective it is, are you regular in your practice, how you organize and manage your life and lifestyle. You know, there are, there are many criteria. So it's, it's very difficult to answer and give you, uh, you know, an instant solution to this. Each person is different. Each person is unique. And there is no quick solution to this. Okay? Okay. So, for me specifically, because when you're sitting in practice and there are times when you're not as passionate about, you know, the internet as you should be, or, you know, you're more worried about silly stuff or something like that. And then you go through these spaces and then you start getting frustrated because your bhava is not sincere. And... What should be? What, what should be? You have created that idea of what it should be. And that is probably the, the reason why you're stuck. 
because you are creating an expectation and that expectation itself is becoming an obstacle. Interesting, yes. I haven't thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have finished this chapter, which is chapter 9. And I don't want to start chapter 10 since we only have a couple of minutes to go. We will continue then with chapter 10 the next time. And um, I hope everybody had an interesting session. Hope to see you next time and have a nice weekend everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, Shibu. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Matthias. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Bye, Mitrosh. Bye, Chandrasheta. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, Rini. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Mary.